to talk about um, is my PhD research, um, which is on the waterfront of Chelsea um, at Chelsea Embankment and how it links in with industrial archaeology. So traditionally, industrial archaeology um, focuses on the remains associated with industrial processes. Um, however, as we have been discussing, um, industrialisation touched all areas of life in the 19th century, from the food that was eaten, the clothes that were worn, and the way people travelled, the time, and of course, how people worked. Furthermore, industrialisation had enormous impacts on the population, urbanisation, housing, um, and the rural and urban landscapes. Um, this paper suggests that whilst the terms industrial archaeology and heritage may still have a role to play, the nature and impact of industrialisation can only fully be understood by integrating traditional functional analysis of sites of industry with socially focused research on the communities involved in and affected by industrialisation. So let me use examples from my research at Chelsea um, and de demonstrates the ways that people who were not directly involved in industrial, industrial processes at all were hugely affected by the general process of industrialisation and also the dominant ideology of the day. Um, so where are we? Um, the Thames environments were located, located in central London, obviously on the Thames, and are generally thought of as, as in, in three sections, the Victoria, Albert and Chelsea embankments. Um, they were built between 1865 and 1874 by the first city-wide government organisation in London, which was Metropolitan Board of Works. They were one part of the main drainage system, which was the first comprehensive sewer system for London. And it's conceived in response to successive cholera epidemics and the Great Stink of 1858, um, when they basically had to close Parliament because they really couldn't cope with this, the smell of the sewage that was on the Thames foreshore. And the idea really was to prevent sewage being pumped in its water when it goes to the Thames. Um, so these are the, the embankments. You've got the. How's it doing? Okay, so you've got the um, Victoria embankment, which is this bit, the Albert embankment on the south bank. And all of this is really sort of the Chelsea embankment, except for the inside of the Parliament. Um, but the bit I'm really interested in, which is this bit here, which was built between 1870 and 1874. Um, um, this is what it looks like today. So this is the, the actual physical embankment itself. It's cut by these uh, lamp posts, which were all part of the original design. Um, this is at low tide, so this is going to come from the field work on the full shore. And at high tide, the water level, you can see the green line comes just up to the parapet wall. So at the start of the 19th century, um, Chelsea was effectively a waterside village, um, which is over here, um, with green space between it and Westminster, <laughs> um, which is this bit here, this was um, Millbank River. Um, it was best access from the river, um, and the riverside infrastructure of Chelsea was <coughs> with a number of wharves and jetties servicing the river traffic. Um, Industrialisation did come to Chelsea in the middle of the 19th century, um, at a time when the whole of London was experiencing enormous changes, including the rapidly rising population and construction of the railways, um, and then what followed obviously the huge amount of housing. Uh, the industrialisation of London itself is obviously a well-known story, um, and from sort of, if you like, um, from a maritime perspective, it's very much focused on the East End with the docks. Um, um, and we talk about it really um, sort of it, uh, in relation to the range of engineering feats that were kind of involved in it, the, the technological achievements, um, and the dra dramatic ways in which commerce, travel and industry <coughs> operated, um, as I say, particularly around the docks and the impact that that had on the city. Um, much of this, um, the industrialisation and, and the changes that took place in London, were driven by dominant ideas of uh, improvement and modernisation and modernity that characterised the Victorian period. And they are all linked in, um, and I'm particularly interested in the impact that, that had specifically for the environment. Um, so, improvement specifically, uh, I just want to look at for a moment um, a modernity and how that relates to industrialisation and specifically the environments. It's been defined quite neatly, I think, by Sarah Tarlow as the notion that things can be and should be made better for the future through human agency. Um, she goes on to add that this perspective on the world is, characteristic, is a characteristic of modernity and that it's quite different to the viewpoint and perspective on the world that was characterised um, sort of pre, uh, sort of this pre 16th century, I suppose, in the, in the medieval world. Um, the idea of improving things for a better future began in the mid 16th century, but was very specific in relation to animal husbandry, weirdly, and the moral self, which obviously combined with quite nicely. Uh, by the Victorian period, um, improvement had become a very uh, political and moral endeavour, 
um, an, in, an improved future was the benchmark by which most all actions that were, were carried out, particularly by government and the upper classes, and they would do it. That was the, is it going to improve the future? That was the, the benchmark by which things were gauged. The improvement movement was well established by the 18th century and was enthusiastically applied to commerce, shipping, manufacturing, science, medicine, industry, technology, and it goes on and on, education, towns, country houses, arts, and the condition of the poor. But it wasn't until 1864 that the term modernity was coined. And since then, there's been an awful lot of debate about what modernity means. Um, it seems to be a sort of a general consensus that um, it, was a, it was about a, a mindset that advocated technological, scientific, and economic development and it covered science and reason, industrialisation and capitalism. Um, and it also had a, very specifically an awareness that, and a concern to, about improving the future. The construction of the urban railways in London were a key part of the improvement and modernisation project for the city, and it went hand in hand with industrialisation as well. Um, other urban improvement schemes um, included the creation of straight, wide thoroughfares such as Oxford Road, um, Oxford Street, um, the demolition or refurbishment of slum housing and the creation of extensive underground sewer networks. Uh, these projects were um, needed primarily to cope with the rapid rise of the city po city's population as thousands of people flocked to London in search of work. The result was overcrowding of housing and of the streets. The tra transport network and waste disposal systems couldn't cope and the embankment projects grew out of these needs incorporating both new streets um, obviously with the roads providing a thoroughfare along the waterfront and, and direct routes into the city from the west, um, and the new sewer system. <coughs> um, in his 1848 book, Dombey and Son, uh, Dickens described a common mid-century London scene, where houses were knocked down, streets were broken through and stopped, deep pits and trenches dug in the ground, enormous heaps of earth and clay were thrown up, Buildings were undermined and shaking, propped up by great beams of wood. Everywhere were bridges that led nowhere, thoroughfares that were wholly impassable, carcasses of ragged tenements and fragments of unfinished walls and arches. In short, the yet unfinished and unopened railway was in progress. He also writes that this work rendered whole areas of London completely unrecognisable. If you were to leave for a few weeks and come back, you could not recognise the landscape that was there. And it really highlights, I think, the the dramatic physical landscape change um, that took place during this time. And a lot of it was, um, even with the underground railways, they were knocking down houses, whole streets, digging trenches, and then they'd cover up and put new houses back um, and pretend that it was all fine, but the whole landscape was completely different from what had been there before. Um, so the demolition of housing was a very common occurrence um, as part of the work associated with the railway, um, and where they could tie in laying a railway with demolishing a slum or better, um, and then you could see that as a bonus, it was a kind of improving the city on the one hand from the transport network and also removing what was seen as kind of a moral and social blight on the city and replacing it with an image of industrial modernity. Um, obviously, the reality of clearing slums was that when you demolish one, all those people are made homeless and they just move into the next door slum and then you're increasing overcrowding somewhere else. Um, it didn't really solve any problem, you just moved it elsewhere. Um, so from what I've been doing on the Chelsea Embankment, there are quite a lot of parallels, um, I feel, um, with the way that the, the railway construction was developed and then the, the process was <coughs> made, with the way in which they sort of enacted, the, if you like, the, the, the process of embankment. Um, the, the embankments themselves and the main train, drainage project as a whole was seen as a triumph of engineering and of modernisation. Um, the newly contained and, uh, and now sort of slightly cleaner River Thames was seen as a, a more appropriate centrepiece for the, what was the imperial capital. Um, with the embankments embodying industrial, technological and ideological improvements for the whole population. Um, on the flip side, and what's not really talked about um, as if you like, the negative of the construction of the embankment, um, there were huge numbers of riverside businesses that were demolished and closed down, um, along with residential streets which had been home to the poorer sections of the working class. Now, not all of these are slums in the way that a lot of the city slums were, but the description of them um, sort of highlights some of the parallels. They were kind of overcrowded tenement um, properties, um, and they were housing the poorer sections of the working class. Um, and they were, and in Chelsea particularly, I think it's quite interesting because it's a, a, a view of the population of Chelsea that we don't have today, um, where you know, it's full of artists and the aristocracy and the very wealthy. But that vision of Chelsea was created, if you like, as a response and a result of the environment of the, of the river. We'll look at that, how that process happened in a second.
So the dramatic landscape changes that resulted from in, with, um, embankment and reclamation of the Thames foreshore uh, re completely redefined the end of Chelsea. Uh, the construction of new roads and the mansion houses on the riverfront brought, brought the extremely wealthy to Riverside Chelsea in numbers that came to define the area to its day. Uh, so that's a uh, modern map, and this is um, the sort of within the area is what I've been looking at specifically for my research, which is obviously slightly on Congo at the moment. Um, so the areas around around Chelsea were becoming industrialised, um, but the physical and social landscape of Chelsea was also changing. Um, I'm looking at but the physical and social landscape changed specifically between 1851 and 1891. I'm obviously not quite finished, um, and I'm going to present you some of the broad observations of, um, if you like, what I see as being the effects of industrialisation of the city and around Chelsea on, on the social landscape. Um, so this is where I've been looking. Um, this is the, uh, uh, the modern map, and obviously you can see this is where the, the embankment runs here, and these are the big mansion houses. Some of these are still um, single house. Uh, they're not turned into flats, they're single, single houses. Um, and this one, Swan House, this is just been renovated there, absolutely stunning. Um, um, I can't see this, I can see. Um, <laughs> this is the 1868 first edition LS map, and as you can see, um, the whole of that waterfront was full of water. This is the Botanical Gardens, that's the Royal Chelsea Hospital where that was set up in flower shape. Um, and we've got wolves um, all the way along here. Um, So, I'm going to start here um, because it provides um, sort of like a bit, a bit of context as to how uh, different the uh, Chelsea was um, pre-industrialisation. We've got a few industrial sites, we've got soap factory and the white lead works, and that's pretty much it. We've got two gardens and a uh, faculty park that we've just been established. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of, uh, sort of these are the stairs um, and there's a few walls that are, we know about along the waterfront, sort of in the 1840s. Um, so largely the, the housing at this time is uh, along the main roads um, and on the back streets between Paragraphs Road, which is just the main road here, the Royal Hospital Road now, and down to the walls. Um, the, from a social perspective, I haven't really explored this in, in great detail, but for, uh, for this talk I just had a quick look at specifically uh, Paragraphs Walk, which is this one here, which is quite interesting because it links down to the river and when the embankment was built that connection to the waterfront was completely severed and they built a new road across here um, and blocked it off. Um, so from the 18, uh, 1841 census, um, what was quite interesting to look at was the, the number of people who were born locally versus the people who were born elsewhere. So we've got 198 people who were living on this quite small stream and quite small houses um, were born in Chelsea. Um, against 121 that were born elsewhere, um, and that includes people that were born, uh, born elsewhere in London um, and also abroad, including Scotland and Ireland. Um, where occupations are recorded, most of them are labourers, bricklayers, um, there's a few sort of army pensioners, um, there's a lot of lightermen, carpenters, painters, baker, police constable, that sort of thing, chimney sweeps, shoemaker. Um, and then there's a very small number of women who have occupations that are recorded and there. We're looking at laundresses, needlewomen, charwomen, um, but the large majority of women are, do not have an occupation. And the houses seem to be occupied by uh, family units, most commonly two family units per house, um, and some, but some of them do have three or four family units um, per household. And the families seem to have between one and four or six children. Um, so, so 10 years on, um, you can see that there's a slight <coughs> change, but an increased density in, in housing um, and there's increasing um, industrial activity, particularly faculty here um, and sort of heading towards some of the areas that are here. Um, look at Paradise Walk again, which is still here. Um, there's roughly the same number of people at this time born in Chelsea as outside of Chelsea. And, uh, and then there's an additional group of people who are identified as being born elsewhere in London, that's quite a small number. Again, um, so the, the local population, if you like, is still quite important in terms of the residents. A lot more women have uh, occupations recorded than 10 years ago, with a range of professions including ironers, washermen and laundresses. And there's also domestic servants and dressmakers and charwomen. Um, and this is just on this one little street. The men are employed in manual labour as previously, with large numbers of bricklayers, dock workers and general labourers. Um, but there's also kind of quite an interesting mix of people. So there's a piano tuner, um, a paper hanger, 
um, a, a farm labourer, a railway labourer, which is interesting because uh, it, before the railway, it's, the railway bridge comes across here, but it's maybe along the same line, so it's quite, obviously quite a, <laughs> quite a trip to work, um, wherever they were working, um, clerks, plumbers, um, and army pensioners. The houses on Paradise Wharf again were occupied between two and four family units, and they vary in size between one and two people to eight people. Um, some of them included children and visitors were obviously included again. Um, I put this, this map in so you can see sort of in um, tally, 10 yearly intervals, but obviously we've got ever increasing uh, numbers of housing um, and uh, more industrial activity down here in Battersea. Um, and the timber blocks that were defined, this, this south bank has, has gone, but I haven't really looked at the um, at Paradise Walk, haven't looked at the, the social stuff there. Um, yeah, so just moving on, please. Uh, so, so 1870 is the first period where I've been looking in any detail, really, if you like, at the social, the social aspect. Um, this is one of the maps for the area, and it still looks like it's quite a lot of green area, but this is the same day as the first OX map, where, in fact, obviously, it's all completely covered in housing. And I think it really quite interestingly highlights um, sort of the issues about using maps as uh, source material and um, kind of what the purpose of that map was. Um, in terms of what they were recording. Um, so obviously the OS map is slightly more trustworthy um, and they recorded it for the sake of recording, but a lot of the, the area maps were recorded um, either for visitors or with a very specific purpose in mind, not, um, uh, not as a like, general description of the topography. Um, but from this period again, you can see uh, it's kind of the peak of, you like, of, of activity on the waterfront uh, in Chelsea. Um, and it's quite, it's quite nicely defined. Um, they've got all the walls and stuff. Um, but I'll leave that up and you can see. You can see the, the, um, the depth of the foreshore is also quite interesting because it provided, even though that they reclaimed an enormous amount of the foreshore with the embankment, there's actually still quite a stretch of it that's um, both got archaeological remains on. <coughs> um, so let's have a look at um, some of the people, how that's all. Look. So um, this is not completely this is, uh, as far as I've got in terms of entering census records for 1871. Um, in, in my little area. Um, and so we'll have a look, another look at Paradise Walk in a bit more detail uh, and see who's there. So on this street alone, so we've got 52% of the population here were women and 38% of them were children, um, which are classified as people being um, not in work and under 15. Um, there were 13, 15 year olds who were in employment. 50% um, of the population of the street was born in Chelsea. And, and almost 70% of the women um, were in employment at this time, which is obviously quite different from sort of like the 1840s. Um, and 21% of the women who were in employment were servants who had no employment, so the servants had employment. So they have an occupation, if you like, but they're not actually employed at that time. Um, and half the women were um, sort of in laundering, so laundresses, washerwomen, ironers. Um, and it's quite interesting, there's quite a lot of um, these laundry sites um, around the area, um, and which I think sort of when we're talking about um, sort of like water landscapes is um, sort of diff very different sort of use of water um, and, and reflect the changing landscape of the of social landscape, if you like, of people who are there and the people who are obviously increasing requirements for, for laundering out of, out of hand, people not doing their own laundry. Um, there are 19 houses on Paradise Walk that have got more than 10 people living in them. Um, and these houses on the northeast side um, of Paradise Walk, just up here, are really small, uh, two up, two down little cottages, um, which look like this. Um, and this one here, they now go for about two million pounds. Um, they're slightly bigger. They do have some extensions, but they're largely <coughs> two bedroom houses. Um, but you can see obviously they've got like roof terraces and stuff and all the rest of it. Um, but uh, it's, I find it actually is a really interesting um, sort of just comparison of, of how dramatically the landscape changed from this street being very solidly kind of lower end working class um, and these, still, these houses um, still there, um, obviously being used by quite a different population. Um, so uh, obviously I haven't, I haven't quite finished um, doing the data over here, um, these houses are, are quite big houses, I expect them to be quite large households with domestic staff. Um, but what I found was quite interesting were the wharf buildings, which I wasn't e expecting, but also have people living in them. I assume they would just be commercial premises, um, but they're not, so there's obviously, there's a 
they're quite you know there's eight people living in that house um, so it's, it's family units, it's, a lot of them are um, employed at the walls as, as clerks or whatever, um, some of them the managers and managers and their, and, and their, house, and their household and their family. Um, so when we talk about businesses being um, removed as part of the embankment works, we're actually also talking about houses as well and um, in black areas that were having to be, to be moved on. Uh, and the other thing that's interesting was uh, Bull Walk, which is down here, and this is Bull Walk. Here, these are tiny houses, they're even smaller than these ones. Um, but um, they employed uh, people who were working at the walls. Um, those five houses down here had 33 people living in them um, at this time in 1871, and that was a mix of labourers, laundresses, charwomen, carpenters. There was a lot of women living in those houses, a lot of single women as well. Um, <coughs> so, what happened when the embankment was put in? So this is this is sort of my area. This is paradise row here. You know, oh, let me go back. Um, but what you can see is um, so all of the wall buildings have gone. They built built through, which is this one here, and put these mansion houses in as well, um, and completely reshaped and remodelled um, the waterfront. Um, we've still got quite a heavy industry going on in that sea, and there's more going on here. But the waterfront here has been turned into something quite different. This is not a working waterfront anymore. This is an area for promenading, it's an area to be enjoyed, um, it's sort of a tree lined avenue, it's um, the, the images that you see of it are a very different sort of environment to be in. Um, this, is, this is improvement, if you, you know, in, in the sense of the parks, let's you know, talk to Kath about it in terms of the ideology of, of having parklands um, and, and green spaces and the embankments sort of sit on the fringes of that as well. Um, so the last bit I wanted to look at very briefly, um, is uh, 1891, where we've kind of the, you know, put in sort of the end of my period and, and sort of the, the change, the social changes are, are very much finished at this point. Uh, so this is the the OS map, we've got Paradise Walk again. Um, unfortunately, half the uh, census records for Paradise Walk are missing, which is really helpful. Uh, but we've got lots of other things that we can do. And one of the things that's really interesting, we've got food poverty maps, so we can look at um, if you like the sort of the wealth of the people who are living in that area. Um, so we've got the, the newly arrived, extremely wealthy, living on their own means. Uh, this is where the aristocracy, the sort of the lower levels of the aristocracy moving. We've got business directories which provide a, a very different perspective. Um, I, have, I will be using these for the other periods I'm looking at as well. Um, but they allow us to identify commercial areas and how that changes through time as well. And the mix of businesses that are serving the local residents. Um, I think for, um, so, 1891 is very different. We don't have things like cocoa houses um, in 1871. Um, we can look in a bit more detail. Um, we can tie it all together. So we can look at the obviously the occupations that are recorded in the census records. We have who classed them in terms of things like the household income, which is really nice because I can use that sort of for early um, periods. And, and you can see that we've got these enormous households down here. So I think there's about six or seven people here who are family, and the rest of them are 24 people. Um, whilst we've got sort of ten households, you know, households of ten people living in these four rooms. Um, so for Paradise Walk, um, women over fifteen make up fifty percent of the entire population that I've been looking at. Um, Forty-two of those are working in domestic service um, on Paradise Walk. So um, twenty-five percent of the entire population that I've been looking at um, for this area are in domestic service, and eighty-two of those are women. So we've got a very, a very different sort of population makeup, and that was one of the things that really struck me as we were going through is this enormous abundance of women within um, in Chelsea. And I'm kind of fascinated to know that that kind of applies to the rest of London, where you've just got loads of these young women, young and married women, wandering around, you know, London working in domestic service. Um, and by comparison to sort of the 50% of people who were born in Chelsea and now living in Chelsea, it's 5% of women and 4% of men who were born in Chelsea at this time. So this has definitely got an influx of um, local people from elsewhere. Um, so we can combine business directories and census records. Um, that gives us a bit of an insight into how, how the, the streetscapes work. Um, and again, sort of come back to sort of how Sarah was talking about the, the shops with the houses above and behind. So this is what you've got here. Is you've got shops with uh, people. I've sort of effectively made up, how, trying to work out how this works. You've got Kind of property number A and B, 
um, some sort of funding behind, um, but you've got uh, businesses that are registered at these addresses with people living both in the business address and at whatever flat A and B is as well. But you can see how they've had a, um, and this is just the, the people who are living in this boat, in this um, few buildings, there's a huge range of um, different occupations and um, living in close proximity. Um, so to, to summarise really, um, the landscape change that we've got um, is, is quite dramatic and um, through period. Um, the industrialisation is not in Chelsea itself, it's around the periphery, but it had a massive impact on uh, the landscape of Chelsea itself, both in increasing population and obviously um, the, the requirements um, that that had in, in, in terms of uh, both transport and the sewage network and then the implications of the, the impact of the sewer and the environment itself. Um, from a social perspective, we've got an increasingly visible uh, female workforce, which is quite interesting, um, and, and a serious change in occupations from sort of uh, labour heavy, if you like, um, being domestic service heavy. Um, we've got issues <coughs> over, um, over uh, overcrowding in the pre embankment periods, and then it all changes quite dramatically once the, the embankments are, are built. Um, and one of the things I want to look at um, as part of the PhD research is to try and follow a few people. Um, that were, if you like, um, uprooted by the embankment and to see where they went to. They obviously went out of London, they may have gone out of the area, um, but it'd be really interesting to see where they went, whether they maintained their occupation, particularly those that are working on the waterfront elsewhere, um, or whether they changed occupation um, and stayed, stayed relatively locally within London. And then, uh, and then gentrification of the waterfront. Um, and sort of to, to bring it to conclusion, really, I've, I've tried to show how um, the mod modernising ideas and the improvement movement were part and parcel of the 19th century of industrialisation of London and to together created the environment that led to the construction of the Chelsea Embankment and how it was all linked. Um, the impact of this was enormous uh, physical landscape change and social upheaval. Traditional approaches to industrial archaeology tread a very dangerous path away from the roots of archaeology, as we've been discussing already today, um, in which we usually understand archaeology as the study of, study of people in the past through material culture. And if we're set focusing very specifically on sites of industry um, and, and things associated with it, it moves away from really our, our understanding. And we can really only understand the nature of industrialisation and its impact um, uh, when we also look at the relationship with people um, and the people that were involved in it and affected by it in a much wider sense. Thank you very much.